Thanks for joining us. Now, in our first story, 21 civil society organizations, including the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, Institute for Democratic Governance, IDEC, and the Ghana Integrity Initiative, GII, have expressed concern about the state's handling of alleged public procurement violations by the Auditor General, Daniel Domelevo. The Economic and Organized Crime Office, Yoko, has been investigating what it says were procurement breaches by Mr. Domelevo in the purchase of 32 vehicles from Toyota Ghana. Already, Mr. Domelevo is in court challenging the mandate of Yoko to investigate him. But the CSOs say, although they are not against the probe of the Auditor General, they are opposed to actions that may undermine the work of the fight against corruption. Let's go straight to the phone lines and speak with one of these CSOs. Um, that is the Citizens Movement Against Corruption's Edem Senanu. Good morning, Mr. Good afternoon, Mr. Senanu. Thanks for joining us. Um, why is the Citizens Movement Against Corruption and its allies not happy about the case, about how the case is being handled? Um, sorry, your line is very faint. I can barely hear you. Is the line better now? If it is, we want to know why these 21 CSOs are not happy about how this case is being handled. Well, um, good afternoon. And uh, essentially, we are of the view that Mr. Domlevo has been very effective in making sure that the task that the country has assigned to him is being done and done effectively. We think that with the facts that are available, um, the kind of approach that Yoko is currently using only seeks to undermine or will undermine the task that he is performing and would leave a situation where many people would think that there's something uncovered that has gone. Indeed, we think that the Yoko could have approached this much differently if they are prized of facts that they think require um, some investigation, uh, but their current approach seems to be detracting from the effective performance of the, uh, of the work of the uh, Auditor General. What current approach, Mr. Senanu? Well, over the past three or four weeks or so, um, over and over again, it appears that the IOKO has invited personnel from the Auditor General's office. Um, and what exactly it is they are looking for has not been made clear to the Auditor General. Uh, the manner in which it's being done does not allow him to be able to plan effectively with his staff and to perform. And we think that that is not good enough. Isn't this normal operating procedure for Yoko that they invite officials of any organization which they are investigating for questioning? Well, it is. But I think that ideally um, it would have been useful if Yoko had indicated what exactly it is that they are trying to investigate. Because at this point, as far as we understand the fact, uh, Mr. Domlevo held on to making any purchases until he was explicitly instructed by the PPA. Uh, so to all extents and purposes, there have not been any loss to the state. There's not been any more officers. There's not been any actions that we are aware of that he has done wrong. Um, so the continuous calling and engagement of his staff without a clear understanding of what it is they are looking for or what the issue is, uh, we think that undermines the performance of that institution. Now, Mr. Domelevo himself, in his letter to the Economic and Organized Crimes Office, has not said that there is nothing to investigate. In fact, his case is that Yoko is not the body to investigate this matter. Uh, so it seems like the one who is the subject of the investigation is aware that there is a matter to be investigated. No, I think that the way he has put it is that uh, the claim is that they are investigating issues of procurement uh, in, in, a, in an area which, as far as he is concerned, is one that has been given to the SPO to operate in. And so that is where he's coming from. Right. Uh, it, it is to the extent of what information he has received from Yoko, but not to suggest that he's saying that something has gone wrong. But if Yoko has come across any investigate any information, and we already know that the executive director for Yoko has responded and said that it's not in Mr. Domelevo or any other Ghanaian's merit to dictate to Yoko how and what they should investigate. So if this body has found evidence which suggests that they can investigate a matter, where are we to come and 
tell them otherwise? No, we are not. We are not. We are not saying that Yoko cannot take actions. We are just saying that the manner in which it is going about it, um, uh, as it were, undermines the effective performance of another key institution of state that has been performing a task that, for us, as far as anti-corruption is concerned, is, is, is crucial. And we are saying that in that kind of engagement, considering that these are institutions that all play a particular function in making sure that good governance. Is, a, is promoted. Uh, we ought to be mindful about how we are put these things, not to detract from the effective performance of the institutions uh, in question. What, in your view, would have been the best way to approach this? I think that ideally, um, in, uh, apart from the fact of inviting Mr. Domlevo, uh, a discussion around what exactly they are looking for and a plan in terms of how they will be engaging his staff would have been something that would allow him to go to understand what is going on, which staff will be available for him to work with, which ones will not be there, at what points, etc. And so that the work of the Auditor General itself does not suffer because of this particular action. Does this not compromise the investigation if I were to tell you ahead of time who I want to invite and why I want to invite them? That compromises the investigation itself. Well, it would not compromise the investigation to the extent that you have a plan in terms of who you are inviting. You don't need to get into the nitty-gritty of what exactly you're going to pick from that person. Thank you very much, Mr. Senanu, for joining us. Let's move from that story. And former director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, Vitus Azim, says he is not convinced about the commitment of governments to ensure implementation of the right to information law. At the sixth Accra Dialogue Series, organized by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and Institute of Law and Public Affairs, he said partisanship, bureaucracy, and lack of political will are hurdles for the full application of the RTI law. Maxwell Agbagba has more. The Sith Accra Dialogue Series on the theme Combating Corruption Vis-a-Vis -vis the People's Rights to Information was moderated by host of News Files Samson Ladi Anyenini with former Gender and Social Protection Minister Nana Oyelita, Vitos Akzim, and University of Ghana lecturer Dr. Lee Duseidu as panelists. Former director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, Vitos Azim, urged governments to exhibit the political will and ensure the full implementation of the right to information law. Do our governments have the political will to fight corruption? I don't think so. Do our governments have the political will to implement the right to information bill and law? I'm not convinced. Because it took us almost 20 years to get this bill passed. If we had that commitment, it shouldn't have taken that long. Will our complicated bureaucracy make it possible for us to easily access information? No, not at all. Even reports on fire outbreaks are considered secret reports. Are we bold and empowered enough to use the information to call corrupt politicians and officials to account? No, I don't think so. There's too much partisanship. Are we willing to fight corruption dispassionately and without partisanship? Again, I don't think so. In addition, the Right Information Act has several exemptions. And some of those exemptions, for me, they look ridiculous because talking about law enforcement and public safety, economic and other interests, economic information of third parties, information on tax. If I know you don't pay tax, or if I feel you don't have to pay tax, I cannot go to GRA and ask this company, does it pay tax? These exemptions, my brothers and sisters, in addition to secrecy laws, which you already have, are in the interest of the politicians and easily sailed, they easily sailed through parliament. There were no questions. Right information legislation does not necessarily mean that citizens can get important government data in all of the country and that they can use it to demand accountability from the powers that be. The government must therefore exhibit a high level of political will, not only to fight corruption, but to be transparent through the effective implementation of the Right Information Act as it will be beneficial to the country. Former Gender and Social Protection Minister Nana Oyelita wants civil society organizations and the media to help in the sensitization of the public. At the end of the day, we want each and every person in Ghana to be able to request for information from your unit committee member, from your district assembly about your water, about healthcare, about education, 
about recreational grounds. A lot of work needs to be done to educate, to train, and to empower the Ghanaian to be able to request for information. Political science lecturer at the University of Ghana, Dr. Ali Dusaydu says the right to information law can do little about corruption because there's a huge gap between policy and practice. I, reading the literature, I've come to the conclusion that the existence of a right to information will not necessarily lead to reduction or the fight against corruption. Why? Because there is a huge gap between policy and practice when it comes to issues of the right to information. Now, when you are looking at the issue of theory, there are a lot of theoretical assumptions that we dance around when we are looking at the issue of right to information. And some of these assumptions usually create a little bit of challenges to our ability to implement the right to information. The concept of practical implementation, we are looking at the effective integration of the right to information laws within the context of what? Our existing bureaucracy. The existing bureaucracy that we have, do they have the political will to be able to implement these policies? To what extent is there a political support and then a will for them to actually go about implementing these policies? Now, the Ochehene or Saje for Amwetia of Repaining the Second says it makes no development sense to continue keeping all the ministries in the national capital Accra. He is recommending to government to have the courage to implement what he calls a one region, one ministry in order to open up the country and also to control migration to the capital city. Delivering a lecture at the University of Education, Winneba, the Paramount Chief of Achim Ebuakwa also called for devolution to make districts in the country run and control their own schools in order to improve educational outcomes. Richard Kojonyako sat through the lecture and has come through with this report. <laughs> Speaking at a packed crowd at the Jufus Anamwa Mesa Conference Hall as part of the Silver Jubilee celebration of the University of Education Wediba, Dr. Hine Osajifu Amwetia of Oripeni II wondered why no government has got the political will to send at least a ministry each to the regions to open up the country. He questioned why some ministries, departments, and agencies are still being accommodated in the capital crowd. Part of the decentralization program that I have spoken about for years. I don't know why everything is in Accra. So you tell me, I don't know why the Ministry of Forestry is doing in Accra. <laughs> or, or the Ministry of Agriculture is doing in Accra. We need to open up our country and build superhighways. And move, we are 16 regions now, and move 16 ministries to one region, one ministry. It brings insurances to various times. People will stay in their towns and work. And it creates opportunities for our country. So whilst they have one B, one F, your chair has one R, one M. One region, one ministry. If we have the courage to do this, this country, trust me, will be turned around. Dr. Chihini was emphatic on the need for a robust devolution of Ghana's educational system. He recommends making the districts in the country run their own schools. Osajifu Amwiti of Oripini also provided an antidote for the education system in the country. He wants teachers to be paid very well in order to ensure positive educational outcomes. Quality education can only be possible when classrooms are small, when cur curricula is constantly upgraded to meet world-class standards. It can only be achieved when a nation will see the urgency of paying qualified teachers in science and technology and other areas, paying them well and respecting the profession.
That's the only way we can find quality education. Remember, buildings and machines don't teach people. People do. Buildings and machines don't teach our children. People do. In other areas in the world where they have prospered, the profession of teaching is raised higher. After all, we are Africa is a source of raw material, unskilled labor. And unless we really have a sustained political will to empower our population, especially the young ones, with information and communication technology, we will not make the competition at a global stage. Thunderous applause by lecturers, students, and faculty through his entire speech in almost every point he made. Richard. Joy News, University of Education, Winneba. To a story that has made headlines this week, and farmers at Isutuari in the eastern region are losing tons of rice to lack of storage facilities and a ready market. Speaking to us earlier, one of the farmers told Joy News they also lack farm implements such as combined harvesters to harvest the grains. Um, we are under producing rice under 2,600 uh, hectares, 2,600 hectares under production. Um, currently, as I speak now, um, there are a lot of rice on the field. We are also uh, we are also having um, a lack of uh, machinery, especially combined harvested. Combined harvested is our main problem because the rice needs to move out of the field first. The rice is getting well on the food, and the post harvest loss this year is very, very high to speak to see because of the, uh, the rain. As a result of change of climate, the rain has also set in, and our combined harvest, which are not adequate, it means the rice are on the food and they are regenerating, which is a, a very bad situation. Apart from that, the quantity that has also moved to the drying floor, we don't have enough sun to dry them because we don't also have electric dryers or solar dryers. So we only dry by manpower on the sun, on platforms. And to be frank with you, uh, we compete on the you're still live on Joy News Today with me, Daniel Dazzi. Still to come in the bulletin, 34-year-old mathematics teacher at Sola Senior High remanded into police custody for allegedly raping a second-year student of the school. I, I actually didn't rape her. Okay. We had sex on the 11th in the evening, but it was on the 12th when she called me to uh, ask me. Uh, she told me whether I'll be coming to the school. So I said, oh, I'll be coming. But at that time, I was also cooking. We have more when we come back. Thanks for staying with us. Now, a Bali magistrate court has remanded into police custody a 34-year-old mathematics teacher, Ernest Oklu of Sola Senior High School in the Sola Tuna Kauba district for alleged rape of a second-year student. The maths teacher is alleged to have invited the victim to the school staff common room to give her shito and yogurt. The victim allegedly refused the gifts and attempted to leave, but her assailant stopped her, forced her, and had sex with her. The Sola Tuna Kauba District's Divisional Police Commander, ASP DeGraft Arma Ije, spoke with Joy News. I, I actually didn't repair. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's very true. Uh, this case came to my office on the 12th of. Uh, November 20, uh, 2019. So, about a week ago, that this case came. And uh, the man is actually in our custody. He's, he was taken to court yesterday and has been remanded up to the 25th of this month to be brought back to the court. The gist of the whole matter is that uh, on the 12th of uh, November the year 20, 
Now the suspect has been telling Joy News his side of the story. I, I actually didn't repair. Okay. We have sex on the 11th in the evening. But it was on the 12th when she called me to uh, ask me. Uh, she told me whether I'll be coming to the school. So I said, oh, I'll be coming. But at that time, I was also cooking. So I told her if I finish, I will bring her some of the shit when I was preparing. So I sent it to her, but she didn't collect the food I sent, the shit I sent to her. So she said my stomach was feeling, and she started rolling on the ground. And I could also overlook at her and then go away. So I called some of her friends to come and ask her in her local language what was wrong with her. Then after some time, she said she was okay a bit. So we asked whether we should take her to the hotel, and she said no. Then I asked whether we should take her to the hostel, and she said no. So she was still sitting there by the sofa on the floor. Then after some time, she started wearing a thing that the stomach was pain. That was on that evening. So after some time again, it was a little bit okay for her. Then we all carried her, her back her. When you say you all carried her, you were who? I was there with the female, some of the female students. And where were your college teachers? They were not around. It was only one teacher who was downstairs who was making a call. What time did this thing happen? What time did she come to you in the uh, start common room and then that occurred? Um, it was around 8.30 in the evening. 8 p.m.? Yes, please. Is this a normal hour that a student should be in the uh, staff common room with you? Uh, it shouldn't be that way. But she said that I, I called her to come for the food. So when she came, she didn't even touch it. Okay. She started wailing on the ground. Okay. Let me get this. You said you had sex. It wasn't a rape. She's just... Away from that story, providing care for sick relatives on admission at the hospital comes with lots of sacrifices and risk. For such people who find themselves at Konfanoche Hospital in Kumase, lack of decent accommodation leaves many of them in the open at the mercy of the weather. This is the ordeal hundreds of people have had to endure in a quest to keep their sick relatives alive beyond the efforts of the doctor and nurse. Nana Sensumenta has more. Konfonochi Hospital is the second biggest referral center after Kolebu. Currently, it serves 12 out of the 16 regions of Ghana as almost all emergency and critical cases ending up here. This establishes the fact that a lot of patients and their relatives from far and near find themselves at this facility. When patients are taken into admission, Relatives must find a place to put up outside the premises of the hospital. The opposite, however, is the case as people pitch camp at every available space to lay their hairs. So today is a typical bad day for people who live here under this shed because it has rained for the past three hours. And people who live here are those whose relatives have been admitted here at Confanochi and they have pitch camps here under this shed. At the mercy of the weather, this is where they have been staying for the past three months. Some have lived here for two months, others three months. They are not asking much. They want authorities to build a hostel for them so that at least they can get closer to their relatives who have been admitted here at Confanochi Teaching Hospital. 
Sister Abna is one of over 200 squatters at what can be described as a makeshift hostel where cardboard and all manner of materials serve as mats and beds. She was on her way to buy warm water from nearby vendor to massage her sick husband who has been on admission for over two weeks, so I followed her. Love News investigation reveals a three-story building to house relatives of patients at Konfanochi Teaching Hospital has stalled for almost four years. Sustainable Development Goal 3 seeks to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all by 2030 may remain a dream in Ghana as public health and safety is compromised. Cross infection, mosquito bites and harsh weather are among conditions that people are exposed to in an effort to keep sick relatives alive. Gloria Ousu traveled from Sechiyoso in the Western North region describes how she contracted malaria a few days after her 12-year-old son was referred to Confanoche for intensive care. Question is, must relatives stay with their sick people on admission at hospital? And it's all because of sometimes, social cultural reasons, people just want to be around, even though it's not their core duty to care for the patients who are on admission here. Government's plan to see the over 40-year-old, almost 1,000 capacity maternity block completed means increased admissions and arrival of caregiving relatives. So, we threw the question at the chief executive of CAT, Dr. Ohneba Osudanso. We inherited a project that was being done on build, operate and transfer basis. But the whole contractual I mean, uh, arrangement was faulty. And when we came, we had to appeal to our minister, we went through also the board discussions, and finally we had to submit a comprehensive proposal for evaluation of the public procurement authority. Uh, thanks be to God, we have finally received the blessing. So hopefully the contractor should resume on site, and uh, I think in the next couple of months. For Joy News, Nana Asensu Mensa, Kumase. You're so live on Joy News today, and coming up in business, Ghana and South Africa have introduced a binational commission to enhance the trade relationship between the two countries. Stay with us.